these guys are commenting on my looks this morning. Oh, yeah. And I just want to remind them, Mama says, if you're not good looking, you should, you should try to look good. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Just be careful when you greet him later. He might get cut. <laughs> so sharp. <laughs> oh. So I, um, I abide in the latter of that. I try to look good. Praise the Lord. We love you. Thank you for being here. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I was, uh, as I was preparing the message this past week and studying the words of our text, I could not help but think that many of God's people are going through a time of despair and confusion because they have forgotten who they are. More so, they have forgotten whose they are. And if you would put it another way, they've forgotten to whom they belong. You see, when we are going through trials and we feel like we are being pressed against the wall, it is easy to forget who we really are. And I'm reminded of the words of Jesus speaking of the prodigal. He says, and when he came to himself. You see, that young man had forgotten who he was, but more tragically, during his wanderings, he had forgotten who his father was. He had forgotten his identity, and as a result, his future was in jeopardy. Thankfully, he came to his senses, and when he did, there was a new perspective on, on, perspective on life, and there was hope for his future. How did he do it? He remembered who he was, but more importantly, he remembered who his father was. In these verses that we are about to consider, the Apostle Peter is doing the same thing for his readers. He is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to a people who are scattered, persecuted, confused with trials and temptations on every side, a people whose present seemed worse than their past and whose future offered little comfort. These were people who have been considered nobodies, they were dismissed from their jobs. They were driven from their homes. They were disowned by their families. They were denied entry into the synagogues and, their, and the places of worship. All because they believed in a crucified Savior. Perhaps it was at this moment in their existence that these Christians, like some of us, were feeling a sense of being a nobody that events in their lives were totally beyond their control, that there was nothing they could do about it, and that was that. But God, through his holy word, and through his apostle, had some marvelously good news to share with them, and with us today also. His goal was to have them remember or come to themselves and remind them of their true identity who they were. And may I say to you, church, it is crucially important that we understand and remember who we are. Amen? And as we look into God's holy word this morning, I want to preach on the subject, living out our true identity. Living out our true identity. For a theme, do you really know who you are? Read with me, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. This is a familiar passage, one that we all love. Verse 9, when you're there, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Peter is saying to them, he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Hallelujah. 
The first thing I want you to see there is that there is a reminder of who we were. That phrase out of darkness in verse 9 reminds us that we have a dark past. We are reminded that when Jesus found us, he found us in the darkness of our sin. Ephesians 2 and, two and, and chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us. It, Paul says, and you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, whereon in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now working in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as us. That was us. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We walked according to the course of this world. We were followers of the devil. We were children of disobedience. Our customs and our habits served only to fulfill the lust of our flesh and the desires of our mind. By nature, we were children of wrath. And Jesus found us when we were, just when we were living, when we were pleased with how we were living, unaware that our freedom and our fun was nothing more than the worst kind of bondage. Because Proverbs remember, reminds us that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but that way is the end of death. That's where the Lord found each and every one of us. We are reminded that we have a dark past, but we also have a despised past, which in times past were not a people. We are reminded that when Jesus came to us, we were not even part of a people. It tells us of our state, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Can you imagine the, de the depth of our sin and the darkness of our past where we were, child? We were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world, outcasts and part of a fallen race of people. Enemies of God, says if he sends Colossians. We have a dark past, a despised past. We have also a deadly past. We had not obtained the mercy. We were beyond the mercy of God. When the Lord came to us, we were totally unworthy of the mercy and the grace that he brought to us. And may I ex remind you today that God owes none of us anything Hallelujah. We all deserve to be in hell this morning. It was grace that reached down in the hell of our darkness and delivered us from that wretched existence. It was grace and grace alone that made the difference in your life and mine. For by grace are ye saved. And in discovering and in coming to the point where we are going to live out our true identity, it's important that we remember the where we came from, what we were. We, had a, we were wretched, lost sinners with a past, dark, deadly, and dismal. We would despise the people. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had he quickened us together in Christ and had raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God he did not leave us where he found us. Amen. Scripture reminds of us who we are, but it also reminds us of who we are now. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation. Hallelujah. The term chosen generation has to do with the glorious truth that God reached down into the teeming masses of lost humanity, humanity and he chose a people for himself. 
And he did it according to his will, his own will. And he took those people, you and I, that he chose, and he created a brand new race of men and women. You see, when God called Abraham, he took Abraham and he formed a new race of people. A race that never existed before. And that's what he has done for you and I. He has done the same with believers. We are distinct. We are a distinct race of people. We may be the same as others physically, but we are vastly different when it comes to the spiritual. Huh? That is why the world does not understand this. That is why the world does not accept us or our beliefs. That is why we are like angel aliens in the world today. Chosen generation. But not only that, we are a royal priesthood. Firstly, royal in that we are now part of the royal kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with royalty. The prince of heaven, the king of kings, the lord of lords. And we are seated together in the heavenly places with him. So we are royal, but secondly, we are priests. And not just ordinary priests, but we are priests of the royal order. Under the old covenant of law, the priest was consecrated by the anointing of oil and the sprinkling of blood. But praise God, that was the blood of an animal. But hallelujah, under the new covenant of grace, we priests have been anointed with the Holy Ghost. And we have been washed in the sinless blood of the Lamb of God. Royal. Hallelujah. When we were lost, we were totally separated from God. Now in Jesus, we have been brought nigh unto God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Under the old covenant, the priest's access into the mercy seat was limited to only the high priest and only once a year. But oh, hallelujah, under the new covenant and in this new relationship, we have a royal priesthood of unrestricted, unhindered access to the Lord. We can come anytime into this throne room. Royal priesthood. We do not need and need another mediator. For our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, has broken down every barrier that stood between us and God. Now we have unfettered access. We can come anytime. Hallelujah. No longer is there a separation that keeps us from the God of grace and mercy. Now we can come boldly. We are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. We are also a Holy nation. We have a new character, church. God, through Jesus, has produced a change in us that now allows us to be something we could have never been before. Holy. You see, the lost can do no good. They have no spiritual good in them. The scriptures reminds us. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seek it after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that do it good. No, not one. You see, people can produce some things that are good from a human perspective, but they can never produce anything that is worthy or good in the sight of God. Oh, but the born again, they are given a new nature. Peter says that we have inherited a divine nature. Oh, and that allows us to become holy. This new spiritual nature has a capacity through the work of the Holy Spirit to produce works of true holiness that pleases the Lord. Yeah. Things like prayer and witnessing, acts of faith, Acts of love and kindness and forgiveness. These are all proof that God, through the Holy Spirit, could take a sinner like you and me and make something holy out of it. And as believers, we can, we can and we should be holy. Why? Because the scripture commands us to be. How do I know? Because the scripture says, be ye holy for I am holy. It is entirely possible because we have been delivered from the darkness and we have been brought into the light. 
flesh can produce a lot of things that look good externally, but only the Holy Spirit of God can produce genuine holiness into a person's life. See, the lost man could by himself clean up himself, but the holy man, the spirit-filled man, the born-again man, he finds that God has cleaned him up. So we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy people. But it goes further than that. It says that we are a peculiar people. We have a new classification church. And the real meaning of the word peculiar is not strange or weird or funny or odd, although some of us are. But it speaks of a purchased possession. A unique possession. Something of rare beauty and priceless. And it brings to mind the, the, the scripture from Malachi when he says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. That word jewel there is the same, has the same meaning as this word peculiar here. The word jewel means peculiar. It means that we are God's own, very own possession. We have value. We have worth. It means we are more precious than the gems and the treasures of the world. Our Lord paid a high price for us. And now he possesses us and we are precious to him. And that means he keeps a close watch on you and I. He looks after us with his greatest care. He protects us and he provides for us and he shelters us. We are secure in him because we are his precious people. Hallelujah. Are you living in your true identity? Once we were despised, worthless people, but now by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are God's prized possession. But God said, you are his jewel. Yeah. That's a reminder of where we were and where we are. But there is also a reminder of where we are going. Read with me, dearly beloved, in verse 11. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. It is important for us to remember that we are not settlers in this world. And Peter uses two words here to stress the fact that we are not part of this world system. The word stranger has the idea of a person who lives for an extended time in a land that is not his own. It carries the idea of being a sojourner or a temporary resident. He is there long enough to need a house to live in and a job so he can carry on his life, but he is not permanent there. He has no legal rights. He has no social standing. He is a stranger, an exile, one who is living in a foreign land. The word pilgrim has a meaning that is even more temporary than stranger, and it refers to one who is merely passing through on one place on his way to someplace else. And both of these words describe who the people of God are. We are living in this world, but the world is not our home. Our conversation is in heaven. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Our destination is heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. We are just pilgrims and strangers here. We are here, God willing, long enough to need a house to live in and a job to feed us. But we are temporary residents. We are merely strangers living in the midst of an alien culture. We are pilgrims passing through this earth on our way to our final destination. And if you have ever met someone from a foreign culture, you, you quickly understand. Hallelujah. You understand that they are from a different part of the world. Well, as citizens of heaven, we are supposed to think and act differently from the people of this world. Amen. Amen. At our new birth and our new nature, all products of heaven. And as a result, we are to be heavenly minded. Because our legal status is in heaven. 
We are not to live by the laws and the standards of the world. The world's laws and its ways are lower than the standards of our heavenly home. So we are just passing through. Many of you were on vacation quite recently. You probably stayed in a hotel. Did you walk with a, with a, with a gallon of paint and paint the walls? Did you rearrange the furniture? Why? Because you were just passing through. You didn't come there. You were not staying there for very long. You were just passing through. And it's the same thing for you and I as heavenly citizens. Don't try to get too comfortable down here. Why? Because you will not fit in. Why? Because you have a different nature. Why? Because this is not your home. And if you try to be like the people of this world, you will be very disappointed. Colossians reminds us, if then ye be risen with Christ, set your minds on the things that are there. Hallelujah. Not the things of this earth. We are pilgrims and strangers and we need to know how to conduct ourselves in this alien culture. So we have a reminder of who we were. We have a reminder of who we are. We have a reminder of where we are going. There's a fourth reminder, what we are called to do. What are we supposed to do with these truths? You see, instead of being partakers of the culture and the mindset of this world, our mission is to share the culture and the mindset of our homeland. Amen. Remember, we are from another world. We are literally ambassadors of, this, of our heavenly kingdom. Hallelujah. We are to do all we can to share the culture of our homeland with the earthbound people of this world. We are to show them and tell them how the citizens of heaven live. Do you have and do you know how the citizens of heaven live? We are to declare the truth of our Savior. Verse 9. That you should show forth his praises. It means that we are to vocally declare what the Lord has done for us. The word praises refers to those qualities that make him excellent. We say he's an excellent savior. We are to declare to the lost and dying world the excellency of our Lord. Always ready and quick to tell everyone we meet who ask. A reason for our hope. We should be a vocal people in our willingness and our desire to share the Savior with the world. But we are also to demonstrate the truth of the salvation, the truth of salvation that we have. There is a vocal side, but there is also a visible side. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which you shall which they shall behold. Glorify God. Hallelujah. There is a visible side to our demonstration of our heaven-mindedness. It speaks of a pure walk. We are citizens of heaven. We are to avoid living like the citizens of earth. If we live on the earthly level, we will find our witness ruined and our lives enslaved by the power, according to the scripture, by, of the lust of the flesh. We are to live with a powerful witness also. Peter says that we believers must live right in a world that is living wrong. That's why they may criticize us for the standards we have or for the things that we oppose. But if we are consistent and holy in our walk and in our dealings with them, the word says that they may just be touched. Some of them may even get saved. Yes. So we are to remember that we have a past, dark, despised, and deadly, but now, but now, church, but now, we are a new creation. Hallelujah. We are a chosen generation. We have a new communion. We are a royal priesthood. We have a new character as a holy nation, and we have a new classification. We are a peculiar people. Hallelujah. But foremost in our minds should be where we are going. 
And until Jesus comes, we will remain pilgrims and strangers in this world. Do not try to get too comfortable. Remember, we are just passing through on our way to our eternal home. We are heaven bound. We are heaven bound people. Yeah. Hallelujah. But let us be reminded that while we are here, we are surrounded by an alien culture that needs to hear about our Savior. And needs to see his truth lived out in us who claim to know him. That is us, church. We are the redeemed. We are the born again. We are the blood washed. We are the Holy Ghost filled. We are the sanctified. That's what we claim to be. How about let us start living it. And let the world see it. Amen. Let the world see who we are. Let me close with this, this, this illustration. This young Christian woman once related an incident she had in an encounter with this young man who was trying to date her. He was not a Christian. He didn't belong to the church. They had nothing in common. She had turned him down twice before, and now she wanted to invite her to some rock concert, and she turned him down again. And in some kind of mockery, he turned to her and he said, he said, you Christians are no fun. You don't smoke. You don't drink. You don't party. You don't dance. What do you do for fun? The young woman turned to her and said, for fun? I get up every morning without feeling embarrassed, ashamed of where I was last night or what I did. The young man was stumped. He couldn't say anything else. Come to think of it, she said, there are many other things that we do for fun as Christians. She said, you see that young lady there? She's now married to a fine Christian man. They have a little, beautiful little girl, and they are building a fine Christian home. That young lady has fun every day knowing that their home is being built under the laws of God. She's having fun every day without the affliction of deep scars of fornication, drugs and alcohol or regrets from her past. She has fun every day knowing that every afternoon she's waiting for her husband to come home, knowing that he's not going to stop by the bar to drink with his friends. She has fun every day while knowing that while he is away from her, his love and his commitment to her will not allow him to flirt or to be in, uh, but his infidelity to show up. She has fun knowing that. She has fun watching him hold his little daughter in his arms and love her with his fatherly kindness. She has fun with the assurance that her home is being led by a spiritual leader and her child is going to grow up in a spiritual home. She has fun with all of those things. You see, church, our faith should not only be seen by the unbelievers as some kind of religious game. Too many of us are living like that. Our faith is some kind of game. We do one thing till the night before and we come to the church the next day. Hallelujah, we come to church on Sunday and we praise and we praise. And come Monday morning, we go out and we do something else. Honesty and integrity should be seen in our lives and our faith should make a difference to the lives of the lost. Some wise saint has said it this way. The best way to keep heaven in mind is to keep the earth out of your heart. Keep heaven in your mind and the earth will be forced to stay out of your heart. And I pray that the word of God today will remind you of who you are, who you belong to, where you are going. But most importantly, what you are supposed to be doing with your new identity. May God be pleased with you and your lifestyle. Let us live out who we are. We claim that we have a new identity. Well, let us start showing the world that new identity. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. May we take the word and bury it in our hearts and begin living what we claim to be. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord bless you, and I thank you for being so patient and listening to me.
May the Lord bring his word to be right in your hearts today. Hallelujah.